Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and ending corporate domination. Instead of our usual program featuring a guest, today we have a program of clips from other programs. The first is a clip from an interview I had with Jim Lockhart on his A Growing Concern cable program on Friday, May 19th. I was his guest and the topic was creating a public bank for Portland, one of the campaigns of the Alliance for Democracy. At the end of that program, we changed the subject to talk about a bill in the Oregon legislature, SB 990, dealing with small module nuclear reactors, in which I explained why Oregonians should be concerned about this legislation. Let's run that now. The next issue we want to talk about, David mentioned earlier, was this, this SB 990. And there's always been a fog around nuclear energy, nuclear, uh, the whole thing, nuclear, because it's just so complicated. Mm -hmm. And then and it, people just kind of tune out. But this, this SB 990, the 990 is, mm -hmm. is uh, I've seen it on Facebook, and I really haven't understood what it's about. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so in the... In the Oregon legislature, there is this bill, SB 990, uh, which was introduced. Uh, and, well, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, so in 1980, the citizens of Oregon were asked uh, through a ballot measure if they wanted to, um, if they wanted to ban all future nuclear uh, facilities in the state. Uh, until there was a national repository for the waste. And there's problems with that. So. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, there's problems with that. So 1980, uh, this is almost 40 years later. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, we, uh, the voting uh, citizens of, of Oregon, said yes to that. So uh, since, since that time, since 1980, we have had no new nuclear um, uh, facilities built in the state of Oregon because of it. And, um, and uh, and so this SB 990 is a workaround uh, 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 and would essentially overturn uh, the voters' wishes from 1980. And it's not S up to vote for the people like that one was. No, no uh, SB 990 would be something that the legislature would do. The Senate has already approved it. And what it does is it says that um, uh, uh, cities and counties could put a, a ballot measure on the, on the local ballot to allow the building or siting of small nuclear reactors in their communities. And small nuclear reactors are something that, rather than having these large Trojan type of reactors, these are, these are smaller reactors, um, a, a, but they are, uh, they're, they're module in nature, so you could uh, bank them together and create oh. still smaller, not not Trojan type, but still smaller ones. But we could have these uh, as a series of nuclear reactors uh, throughout the state. And only the local community would have to decide, would have to vote to approve the siting of, of these nuclear reactors. So, mm -hmm. so this, you know, just because they're small doesn't make them any less dangerous. It reminds me of a while back when the federal government was trying to bribe some of the tribes, the Goshoot Indian tribes, I think, accepted a bunch of money in order to, to site a bunch of nuclear waste there. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the exact same uh, well, it is, tactic. Well, it is the same, same kind of tactic. It's, so SB 990 uh, you know, takes, uh, undermines, or uh, yeah, I'll just say undermines, the, the measure that we all passed at the ballot in 19, 1980 to not cite nuclear facilities in the state of Oregon until there's a national repository for the nuclear mm. waste, which you know, we thought at that time that Yucca Mountain uh, was going to be that re repository. Yeah. And of course that has, um, that has, uh, no. that has just not happened. Nevada didn't and there's want nothing it. <laughs> else, there's nothing else that's on the horizon that would be a national repository. So if you have all these nuclear reactors uh, that this bill 
could potentially allow to have built in the state of Oregon, what are you going to do with the waste? And yeah. there would be radioactive waste at every one of them. And also they'd yeah. all need a large amount of water to keep it cool. Uh, so it would use yes. a lot of water. Yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole slew of, of, um, of uh, I, I have in front of me a, a letter from the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. Good group. Uh, yeah, they do really excellent work. SB 990 is ill-advised premature legislation that would create a, a special exemption from Oregon's voter pass moratorium on nuclear power plant construction for small module reactors. Um, so I mean, that's kind of, that's, that's what that's about. This actually has already passed in the Senate. Ooh. Uh, only three senators voted against it. And so it has to be defeated now in the, in the House. So I invite everybody to call your um, representative, your Oregon representative, and ask them to vote no on SB 990. Anything on what the uh, ma uh, mayor, the, the governor, would do about this? He could just get rid of Don't it. Don't know. Uh, yes, the, the governor could veto it. Um, but it would be probably local jobs and different things. That, well, that's it, how they always appeal to people. Uh, yes. Now, I, I think that this is one reason why this is happening in Oregon right now, is that one of the major manufacturers of these small nuclear module reactors is, is new, new scale. Uh, which is a spinoff from Oregon Health, Oregon uh, State University in Corvallis. Really? And so uh, these, so there is this local jobs uh, kind of aspect to it. I, I don't know how many jobs would actually be created uh, mm -hmm. from it, but but potentially, you know. And so it's kind of a. Uh, I, I I'm sure that they are the people that are behind this bill. I was going to ask that, and I got off away from that. But it was uh, it was OHSU, you said? Oregon, or, Oregon, or, or, Oregon State University. Oregon State. Uh, I'm sorry, or, Oregon State University. Oh, wow. well, the, you know, mentioning jobs. Well, that's not how, how many people in all these smaller towns all over the state <coughs> have nuclear physicist experience. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. they would be bringing people in, and you yeah, know, yeah. maybe maybe uh -huh. there'd be some jobs to, for the building it, just like oh, yeah. you know, just like the. Uh, the uh, the plant out there in in, uh, in the gorge where they want to uh, you know bottle water mm -hmm. yeah you know, yeah there's like, a few right. jobs building that but after that yeah uh -huh. well I'm glad you I'm glad that I heard that it was uh, this was an alert by Lloyd Marbet yes. who's been on the program a few times and he's been on the program trying to trying to get public utilities as well yeah um, so he's on the ball with this and I yeah. need to get a hold of him so we can talk about this yeah and Lloyd, Lloyd Marbet is uh, just for our audience don't remember Lloyd Marbet. He is the person who uh, initiated, I think, three or maybe four different initiative campaigns to close Trojan down. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and of course, he was not successful in getting any of those approved. But after, shortly, just within months after the last one was defeated, and PGE, which operated Trojan, spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat it, uh, PGE then had to close Trojan close it down, down itself anyway. because of the, all the leaky pipes and stuff mm -hmm. that was totally right. defective. So just to follow up on that, here's a list of the members of the Oregon uh, House Committee on Energy and Environment so you know who to contact on this issue. and also contact your own Oregon representative in case it moves that far. The calls are needed right away. So don't delay, call today. Now let's move on to this second short clip advocating for a 28th constitutional amendment. This nation was conceived as a constitutional democracy. We want democracy. This means off, by, and for the people. Every citizen, not just the fat cats. Fairness. We just want fairness. We don't have that. Not even close. Wall Street, big business, the media. Too much corruption. Our government belongs to us. We need government to be honest and transparent. 
Elected politicians are supposed to represent us. Instead, they're stuffing their pockets big time. Legalized bribery, that's what I call it. Corporations and the wealthy use their money and influence to shape the world they want. Without regulation, without taxation on them, without regard for the consequences of their actions. Corruption is the illness. There is a cure. It's a constitutional amendment that says this. As a citizen, you have one vote. It does not give you the right to use your money to pervert our political process. The constitutional amendment must also say this. Only flesh and blood human beings are people. Corporations are not people. They are accountable to the people and must earn the people's trust. A group called Move to Amend has as its single mission the adoption of a new constitutional amendment. A 28 amendment that says very specifically that money is not speech and corporations are not people. A 28th amendment, that's what we need. Whatever your cause, this is a big part of the solution. It's going to happen. Join us, help to amend the Constitution. If you care about the future, this is how you can make a difference. We are moved to amend. We are moved to amend. We are moved to amend. We want a better world. This is how we make the difference. I'm happy to announce that the list of co-sponsors in the U.S. House of Representatives for a 28th Constitutional Amendment is growing almost daily. The bill which we are supporting is H.J.R. 48, the proposed We the People Amendment. There are now 39 co-sponsors, including Oregon Representatives DeFazio, Blumenauer, and Bonamici. Among, among Oregon Democratic Representatives, only Representative Schrader is missing. Where is he? Help us get him on board by calling or writing his office, asking him to support the We the People proposed constitutional amendment HJR 48 which would amend the U.S. Constitution to declare that money is not speech and corporations are not people. So let's show that contact information. And we're going to conclude this half hour with a clip from Walt McRee, chair of the P Public Banking Institute, a major proponent of the creation of public banks throughout the United States including municipal banks. And here's Walt. Let me say a couple of things about the public banks. What they are not, they are not uh, public. The public bank is in the model of the North Dakota Bank. Uh, that's a state-owned public bank in which all of the deposits, all the tax revenues, all of the fees and parking tick you know, the fees and the penalties, all go in by law, goes into their bank, and they, and they use that bank as the depository for all the state's receipts. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the state of North Dakota doing business as a bank. So uh, now this, the state model is one thing, but state banks, public banks could also be created on the city level or the county level or created in a regional sort of a way as well. And the idea simply is to keep your money at home and invest in yourself. And, the, and, and so it, it, it starts to re-support the notion that a local economy has its own integrity, and its own wealth, and its own objectives, and instead of sending your money off to Wall Street and let them speculate and deny, let them, you know, let, let the equity, the assets of your community be used to finance the needs and the desires of the community. So a public bank is not, as, as we envision in any way, it's the North Dakota model, but I think uh, this is a, 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 a very successful one because that's 96 years old. Uh, is not a commercial bank. That is to say, it doesn't make you, won't make you, uh, a mortgage, it won't give you a mortgage, it won't give you uh, a car loan, you know, they don't have ATMs, they don't have branches. They essentially, in our model especially, they do not compete with local financial institutions like community banks, credit unions, savings and loans. Where the competition that we envision and that uh, is if you were, if you were the strongest prospect and the most desirable prospect is that the creation of public banks will push back against the global banking interests, which we collectively call Wall Street, Wall Street banks, which have really been running roughshod over our 
society and our economy uh, for a long, 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 long time. Uh, as you know, money and power are pretty much synonymous. The politics uh, derives from the money influence and, and the money connections. Uh, so there is a, there's a point to this that has to do with democracy and you know, our governance that's very important to consider. Because when you look at America, you realize that we don't have a democracy here. This is an oligarchy. Princeton pretty much, uh, and Northwestern, I think, had that wonderful study about two years ago and said, what, you know? <laughs> well, over the last 40 years, you look at the will of the people and you see how much that gets reflected in public policy. And I like to say, there's no statistically significant indication that anything that y'all want shows up in the law. So, uh, and that's necessarily, that, that's the, the icing on the cake, or at least the, the, the surface appearance. Uh, so we have a problem. We have a real banking problem. We have a, we have a problem with uh, governance being tied to money and the consolidation of money and the continual stream of, of uh, uh, capital development and, and profiteering becoming in the hands of fewer and fewer people which of course undermines the great wealth of America, which uh, and the, the middle class and the, the diversity of our economic system, we've all been pretty much reduced down to a level of debt, serve, debt slaves, you know? Now, that is kind of at the cusp of the problem about our money system, that, uh, that we have to pay interest on every dollar that we borrow. Uh, and it's interesting because that is the franchise that makes banking so rich. Uh, compound interest is this extraordinary device, as you guys probably know, that you know over a period of years you, know, you can pay three, four percent on, or five percent on your mortgage, and then the price of your house suddenly doubles in a period of thirty or forty years. That's true for municipal borrowing too. So when we borrow money uh, to pay for infrastructure or pay for anything, uh, if we don't come up from it with our out of tax money and out of the money that we have uh, in a municipal level, uh, we have to go to Wall Street to borrow in bonds. Now this is the this is the point where I'd like to we'll focus a little bit later on in, uh, in this discussion about um, what we can do to reclaim our democracy or at least uh, give ourselves a chance in what little time is left to get our hands on the levers of uh, of our democratically based policymakers. And, and governance uh, by holding on to our money and creating a device, a new device, that allows us to actually build a mechanism for growing our wealth instead of continuing going to borrowing more money and going into more debt and having more taxes out of debt. We talked about municipal finance, and I'll just say briefly about that, that if you were a, a treasurer, a city treasurer, county treasurer, whatever, your, your choices, your ability to fund things is really limited uh, in a couple of, uh, to very bad choices, essentially. If your budget will not sustain the need to repair a bridge, and most city budgets don't, because they have to be balanced uh, at the end of the year, and they probably didn't budget for that particular bridge. Let's say it's a $50 million bridge. They don't have access to that in their budget, so what do they do? The, they can do, what can they do? They, have, they can go into more debt, which drives taxes up. Or they could sell some things, which is a terrible idea, because you know, if you sell off the public wealth and public assets, especially to privatize it, that diminishes the overall equity and assets of the base. They can cut services to us all, you know, cut police, fire, and all that stuff. They can fire people. Those are kind of the five principal options that, that the municipal financial managers have. So it's a cycle of debt, taxes, debt, taxes, debt, taxes. All of a sudden, the public banking prospect shows up on the horizon that reverses this 180 degrees. And that's what's so cool and exciting about it and why there are 50 initiatives around the country to create public banks. Many of them doing very well. We've come right over, we've been working on this for about five or six years, five years, six years, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and we are now seeing uh, developments in, in Santa Fe, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, uh, several places in, uh, in California, Arizona, etc., uh, etc. Et the list is quite, quite long. These initiatives being basically people in their towns who have gotten the word, seen the picture, uh, you know, seen what the thing is, and say, look, you know, let's stop paying, uh, let's stop paying our money to Wall Street, keep the money at home. So there's a campaign I'm going to tell you about at the, uh, at the end of this about that. 
But let's take a look locally at what this means. Uh, Portland uh, pays $48 million in interest alone every year on its debt. $48 million. I don't know what you guys would do with $48 million, but I can imagine it could be useful somewhere. Perhaps enriching your school system or whatever. The list is endless, right? And there are a lot of things that you're not doing because you don't have that $48 million, right? Uh, and that's just one year. And so you can multiply that times 10, it's a half a billion dollars, and you know, 20 years, which goes by faster than we like, that's a billion dollars. And so cumulatively, you have this continual downward drain of efficiency, of, of, of diminishment of your common wealth. The state of Oregon uh, spends about $348 million every year in interest and, fee and, and fees just to borrow its money, just to manage its money. And believe me, that's on the low side. That's only the stuff that we see because a lot of the lending, a lot of the management of the money is proprietary trade secrets for these, for these management funds and so forth. So this is just what the annual report uh, of, the, of the Portland and Oregon uh, are reporting thanks to what one So how does a public bank change that? Well, Let's take an example that was in the news this morning here. Uh, I was really delighted to see that you've got a group in your city council, uh, and I'm not sure that a committee of some sort having to do with socially responsible investing. And they said, look, Wells Fargo, which is where we have our money, uh, is uh, uh, we have $40 million sitting in Wells Fargo's corporate, uh, corporate bonds. Uh, and what they do is they invest in private incarceration systems. So they're propping up, in addition to the other uh, very uh, unfortunate investment choices, um, they're investing in that. And we don't think that's right, and we don't want our money going there, so let's pull it out. Now, what they're going to do with it, I don't know. They have some choices. But if they had a public bank, let's, let's just imagine that you had a public bank. Let's take that $40 million, create a public bank, a, public, uh, a, a Portland public bank, and uh, with that capital, the 40 million capital, what the banking law allows, and this is what's so cool about the franchise, is that you can, uh, based on having that 40 million, you can create 400 million dollars in credit. 400 million dollars in credit. You actually have to take that 40 million off the top, right? That's reserved. Now, what? We don't have 40, 400 million dollars. Where does that come from? Well, the, it, it depends on, on uh, it depends. It comes from the deposits and the flow uh, that comes through the coffers of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the municipality and the state. So what could happen if we had uh, that kind of money to, to redeploy, to reinvest? How could we in invest? How could we start to save some money right away for public bank in Portland? Well, let's go back to that $50 million bridge. If you want to, uh, the city wants to build a bridge, they will go to, they will undoubtedly have to go to the bond market, which is Wall Street personified. That's where the action happens. Uh, but then the bond market includes, is, is driven by, uh, aside from the host of collaborative support of warm political uh, patronage of bodies, and no offense, that's uh, not offense at all. That's just the way, our, that's the way things work. You know, people work in the league, that's fine. Um, and uh, so the bond prices will, will take will first of all position the bond, they'll assess the, the risk, they'll put it on the market, they'll underwrite it, and they'll uh, provide insurance for it, there will be attorney's fees, uh, and then and you'll be in the bond market. And I don't know what your credit rating is, but it might be say three, four, five percent, let's say four percent. Uh, that's what I know Seattle is paying about three and a half percent. They just refinanced some of their bonds to pick up the margin, because obviously over time, little bits of improvement in interest save you a lot of money. So the bond market, let's say, will give you 4% on that $50 million loan, and over a period of 20, 25 years, it will increase the cost of the bridge about 50%. On average, the price of infrastructure is, is half of the cost that you pay. It turns out to be interest or, or, or financing. So in, in California, for example, the, the, the Bay Bridge was a $6 billion improvement for time materials and so forth. Uh, the financing was $6 billion. Uh, and, and, that, and that in itself then, if you have a, if your public bank says, well, um, 
you know, since we're lending to ourselves, and since our purpose isn't to drive big paper profits, we don't have to maximize our profits here. What we want to do is build this bridge. And we'd like to save, so we want to save ourselves the money. We can do this. We've got enough. We've got four hundred million dollars of equity or of, of potential credit to distribute or to deploy it to the best. We can do this bridge, and we'll do it one percent, three percent margin, right there. Huge savings, right there. Twenty is huge savings. Uh, so, not only do you can they save that amount of money, uh, the one percent. You're still paying interest, though. You know, isn't, what, isn't that still the problem? Well, the 1% you're paying to yourself. So what happens is that you actually start to make money from your public bank by financing yourself through the equity and the assets that you have. So, so it's, it's simply stay-at-home investment uh, that, that is a, 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 has a virtuous cycle of investment creating value, investment creating value. So it's counter <coughs> Further, yeah. And to, con to contact the Portland effort, the Portland Public Banking Alliance, contact me at davidafd at ymail.com. We would love to show you as a supporter on the Public Bank uh, Alliance website to add your, add your name to the list. Go to our webpage at www.afd-pdx.org slash public bank, click on supporters and complete the form. You can further support by calling any of the Portland City Commissioners and let them know that you support the City Commissioning a Public Bank Feasibility Study. That's the next step for getting this done here in Portland. So I ask them to, to support commissioning a Public Bank Feasibility Study. Thank you for watching the Populist Dialogues. I hope you, we will see you again next week and that you will move forward toward a progressive populist tomorrow. Bye.